right. Hello, everyone. Um, today, I wanted to come back to a couple of the problems that we were we left off on last time. Um, also wanted to give you another practice problem with uh, a chemical equilibrium problem. That's something that I normally cover in disinfection, but it's kind of the same principle, so I wanted, decided to go ahead and take that and uh, give you that as another um, piece of practice for the exam. So those, those are the first two things we'll be doing today. After that, we'll start working on granular filtration, which is the next topic. Um, like I said last time, I'm not gonna cover this equation side of things. I'm gonna build up the definitions, the concepts, why we care about it, and what our approach is to, to these systems. So I, I do believe it's relevant information and you're gonna need it to understand the content, um, but I'm not gonna give you more equations that you have to worry about for you know, so to con be concerned about for this uh, exam on Tuesday. Um, regarding that, the uh, coming exam, um, I think I misspoke some time ago about um, if, if you have the ODS uh, forms, I do think they, they still allow paper copies. It might be too late um, as I uh, learned today to sign up for that. So. I'll be in touch with those of you who need that, especially I know there's a, at least one person who can't um, be in person for that either. So if you are in that situation, make sure that I, um, I talk to you about that, about the plans, or if you're unable to be here in, in class for the exam, also make sure that um, I'm aware of that. Uh, otherwise, I expect you to be here um, for the exam uh, we have plenty of room in this in this auditorium, so that it shouldn't be too much of a concern. Um, and it, all the seats are are uh, separated anyway, so that that works out. So that's the plan. Again, if you have any issues, if you have any um, uh, other other things that would prevent you from being here, uh, please, as always, talk to me, um, and we'll figure it out. Okay. So last time we left off, we were talking about Homework two, uh, problem number three. We got through part B. I went ahead and uploaded the uh, solutions for you. Uh, but just as a reminder, part B was um, a system of flocculation chambers. We went through, um, part A was just determining what, you know, given the different power inputs, what was the mixing intensity for each of them. Part B then said, okay, given these conditions, how many particles are we expecting to be coming out of the first chamber, if we um, if we consider water flowing in and it goes through three chambers, how many particles are in each aggregate coming out of that first one? So we had initial and then N1. That was the question for a completely mixed, so a CSTR system here. Um, part C then, follows up and says, well, what if we change it from this uh, continuous flow and just use that reactor as a batch reactor, um, stirring with the same intensity and just give it 10 minutes. Now, if you, if you take a look and um, consider the hydraulic retention time, given the flow rate, all of that, one thing you'll notice is 10 minutes is a very long time compared to how much time the water normally has uh, to stay in there. Um, I do apologize, I know a few of you were we're looking at the, the answer and thinking you were maybe doing something wrong. Um, I just arbitrarily put 10 minutes. Um, I won't do this to you on an exam where it, there, there's a chance it's going to be some crazy number. I'm going to solve the solutions beforehand for the exam problems. That way you won't have this uh, kind of confusion. Because it's good normally for you to be able to check, say, hey, is this realistic or does this, does this not make any sense, right? So I'd, I'd like to, for you to be able to do that. And I apologize this one, I, I didn't allow that. We got a question? Do you know how many problems are gonna be on the exam? So how many problems are gonna be on the exam? Um, typically it's a, around three, um, you know, maybe the, about the length of this homework, uh, homework number two here. So that would be that would be fairly representative, maybe three problems each with two, two to three sub problems. Maybe if I, you know, depending on the topic, um, I might end up with something that's uh, less involved subparts, so kind of easier calculations, and then maybe you'll have five or six subparts. Um, what I try to do is I try to make sure that 
the next subpart does not rely on the previous one, or if it does, I'll be watching the um, the answer so that if you if you did get the part A wrong, I'm not penalizing you all the way through. So okay. um, on the homeworks, I, I don't grade quite as thoroughly in terms of partial credit. I just default give partial credit, and I haven't started grading them, but I'll, I'll get back to you guys um, next week with probably both homework assignments. Um, but for the exams, I do go through and I, I grade partial credit um, depending on uh, your how close you are to the correct process or to a correct process. Um, if it's just units you miss, I generally give you like you have a wrong answer, but you got everything right except like uh, you got a digit wrong or got the units like one one unit mistake and that that was it. That's I'll typically give you like ninety percent of the credit um, for the wrong answer. Um, and so if I see a concept wrong, that's more like 30% uh, of the credit taken away and, you know, can compound if you, if you tried it, you'll get something. Um, if you're just nowhere near uh, the right, right attempt and I can see you just scribbled some stuff, maybe I'll just give you like 10% of the credit <laughs> for, for thinking about showing me that you're engaging with a problem at least to an extent. And I understand occasionally there'll be times where I, I make an exam that's too long and I, I'm sympathetic to that if I recognize that. In the past, I have had to curve exams, so um, I'm not saying that I will, but if I, if I make a big mistake, then I, I probably will. All right, so hopefully that answers uh, a few questions. Happy to answer more as we go, so feel free to, to stop me at any point. Um, okay, so part, part B then leading into this part C for uh, this problem. Uh, like I said, it's not a super realistic scenario because the water in the normal system, let's see, the flow rate was um, 1,600 cubic meters per day. I think that translated to, might not have it written out. Um, but within 60, a 60 cubic meter volume, that's, the water's going by pretty quick. And I believe if we did that calculation, that's going to be less than 10 minutes. What was it? The flow rate was 0 0.185. 0 0.185 cubic meters per second. Okay. So with that, if we did if we did V over Q, that's going to be um, so that guy divided by 60, or excuse me, 60 divided by that. That's going to be somewhere around 200, 300 seconds um, for the for the flow rate. I um, guess I could do it real quick. So you can see. Um, if we do 60.185. So that's 300 seconds, so five minutes. Um, So a little over five minutes. So not, not a huge difference, but it is shorter than the, this 10-minute uh, time frame. Um, just pointing that out um, just as a note. But the other thing about batch operation is we do have a much higher efficiency of the reaction because um, we're not losing some, some of the stuff that could be reacting continuously, right? We don't have that continuous leaving of the solution. So anytime we're doing a batch process or a plug flow process, we get that reaction to go much further than it would in a, a CSTR. Okay, so anyway, the solving this problem then, um, again what we're looking for is that n naught over n. And we know um, previously from looking at batch kinetics, this is first order decay, we, we know that. I'm going to go ahead and kind of do a little bit of shorthand. We could derive this again, but we know this is going to be the form of the equation, right? The n equals n naught e to the minus kt. This time, though, since we're solving for n naught over n, our solution is going to look a little different. It's going to be 1 over e to the minus kt. So here, 
we solved for k previously for this problem um, in part b we found k was 0 0.05 per second and we have 10 minutes and we'd convert that to seconds so 600 seconds And so then it's really just putting in the numbers here into the equation, and we should get a, a number out. Again, a lot of you were unsure because this is kind of a ridiculous number. It would be 1.01 times 10 to the 13th. So clearly that's, that's a, kind of a silly number. We probably didn't even have that many particles in the system in the first place. So we'd probably end up with running, running into some other physical constraints probably would have agglomerated into a blanket or something and settled down um, or done something maybe the stirring would be, end up being fast enough to keep breaking them back apart but based on the <clears throat> the scope of what we're working with where we don't assume anything like that um, they basically all become one big aggregate and that so just demonstrating here um, for for the flocculation system this might be in some ways better for getting larger aggregates but in, in some sense doing a series actually works very well because first of all we're not doing batch processes that just takes a long time to fill and um, unfill the the tank but also as as we go you know so we treat a lot more water per time but we also don't need massive massive aggregates we, we can be just happy with you know if this side I think so last time the answer was 17 per aggregate and maybe the next time we have I don't know 10 of those and then maybe five of those we're really we're multiplying this across so we've got much larger aggregates by the time we are coming out the final stage and that works um, that meets our needs very well because we really just need a, a relatively small increase in the particle diameter right if we're if we're now have like 200 particles per every aggregate in the final one, something like that, then our average diameter is much larger and that's going to settle much faster. So we don't really need to go that extreme, uh, is my point. Okay. And again, I will uh, either give you some hint that it would be, you may not be a, a reasonable number or, you know, I'll, I'll make sure that the numbers that you're calculating on the exam are within kind of the rational, uh, reasonable realm. Okay, so that was, uh, that was the end of the homework solutions. Uh, those are posted, and the video is posted as well. And I'll likewise post this, uh, this PowerPoint and the video um, later today. Uh, so the next thing I wanted to do is just a little more exam review because we're going to get into the chlorination anyway. Um, really, we're going to do filtration and then t then talk about chlorination. So um, I just pulled this example out um, from our chlorine uh, section. So here's a problem. Um, we'll talk more about the specifics of chlorine. HOCl is the stronger oxidant. That's why we care about which, which form it is. Is it HOCl or OCl minus? We'll get into that more. Um, just for today, that's kind of the reason we care about this problem. Um, okay, so problem says if we have 15 milligrams per liter of HOCl, it's added to a potable water for disinfection. So potable meaning it's intended for drinking, uh, drinking water uh, purposes. The final measured pH is 7. What percent of HOCl is not dissociated? And assume the temperature is 25. Don't worry about that. We're not gonna we're not gonna worry about the temperature dependence of the dissociation constant. That's a thing um, when we whenever we look at the uh, equilibrium equations, KEQ. Um, for chlorine, we we're gonna use 10 to the minus 7.54. Um, that's temperature dependent. For our class, we're not gonna bother with the temperature dependence. We're just gonna use this value. Okay, so this is the equilibrium constant for uh, chlorine then. And 
I think the probably the biggest issue with this problem that you may find is simply understanding what it's asking for. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to give you another another problem here to work is to to have more practice seeing seeing a question like this and, and understanding where to go. So we add HOCl uh, to some water and it's given as a some concentration. And as we look at the problem, there's a couple things to notice. We're working with a mass concentration and then we're given a pH, which is in molar concentration, and we're asked about the dissociation, so we're doing some equilibrium reaction. We're going to need to get into molar concentration. So at some point, we're going to need to convert from mass to moles, and we also know we're going to need this equilibrium equation. So we need to define the reaction. So we've shown it before, but so you have it again. When we add HOCl to water, it goes through a dissociation reaction that goes forward and backward and it can dissociate to H plus and OCl minus and we assume we reach this equilibrium um, and that's what we're talking about so essentially the amount of reactants going from reactants to products is the same as the amount of products going to reactants that doesn't mean the amounts of stuff on each side are the same that just means we have the same speed of them going across. Okay, so just again as kind of a final reminder here, our equilibrium equation is essentially the, the products over the reactants in that, in that form where we have the mole, you know, moles products um, multiplied by each other divided by the moles of the um, reactants. The other thing you'll need to know is the molecular weight of HOCl. That's going to be 1 for the H, 16 for the oxygen, and chlorine is 35.45. Okay, so I'm going to give you a couple minutes to solve that.
So one thing that may help you to begin with is when we say we have 15 milligrams per liter of HOCl that we're adding, um, that's a good starting point to say, okay, well, how much total chlorine do we have in the system? Because then we're going to branch that apart into um, the two components. So we can look at that total, the total molar amount, I'll just abbreviate it as total, as the HOCl plus OCl minus. And this gives you one equation to use in this problem um, in addition to the other equation. So when you're solving for systems of, you know, uh, multiple unknowns, having a system of equations is really helpful. So that's that's one equation you might not think about right away, but can be very helpful. We've got a question um, online here. So somebody's asking, uh, why is the total equal to HOCl plus OCl minus? Um, so the total amount of chlorine species. So when, when I say the total chlorine, really what I'm what I'm referring to is any any molecule that contains that Cl or really OCl. Um, so both HOCl and OCl minus contains that OCl. That OCl is what's active for us. So when we when we do this on a molar basis, the total concentration after it's dissociated. So we add it we add it entirely as HOCl. 
we pour it in um, as, as a liquid solution. That's, that's the example we're given. Okay, that, that doesn't quite happen in reality, but that's what we're saying. We're adding that, then part of it dissociates. So it was all HOCl, but now it e equilibrates in the water, and now we've got some OCl minus and some HOCl. The total is still on a, on a uh, molar basis is one plus the other. Um, something else could affect the H plus. You know, we could add base or acid. In this case, we're told exactly what the um, pH is. So we're not going to measure the H plus and for, you know, and, and describe our, our total chlorine based on that. We're going to describe it based on the OCL on both sides. So with that, um, you know, if we started with, let's say, 100 molecules of HOCl, and it splits up so that there's 40% of it is not dissociated, then we'd have 40 molecules here and 60 molecules here. Um, and the total, again, would still be 100 because that's how much we added. It's a good question, and that, that comes up a lot when we start um, dealing with this. So let me know if that helped or, or is still unclear. So I went ahead and put the um, molar, the total molar concentration, found that here. Next step would be to find the HOCl at pH 7. So here we can use our um, equation up here to say 10 to the negative 7.54 equals the products, which would be the H plus times OCl minus divided by the reactants. So.
so we had a question about the uh, ka why it's negative 7.54 i'm i'm giving you that as a constant here um it's not related to the problem itself aside from i mean it's independent of the problem so we have different ka's for different um, species it just so happens we're dealing with a ph that's near the 7.54 that that kind of tells us we're near the point where they're they're split 50 50 in terms of how much is on each side um, given the ph but it doesn't um, yeah we, we don't derive that from the problem i give you that as part of the problem it was it was letting you look that up by giving you the temperature but like i said earlier we're not dealing with the temperature we're just doing i'm just giving you that constant all right so i think if i've done my algebra right here on the fly we've got this we can solve for the hocl um, by inserting the ocl minus instead of ocl minus we insert the total minus hocl so we substitute that in that second equation that we we had um, just solving it for hocl and or excuse me solving it for ocl minus and then inserting that into our equation that we were solving then we just need to separate out hocl by itself again i think i've done that here so correct me if you see something wrong i didn't have this uh solved all the way in my notes so then that should give us the h plus divided by ka times the total all that divided by the one plus h plus over k so double check me here um, i'm going to put this into excel um, and what i'll say is just based on our knowledge that we have a slight we have a neutral ph which is slightly under that ka we should have a little bit more o hocl as our final answer once we convert it to a percentage should be somewhere above 50 percent but probably not up quite at 100 percent Can you repeat that? So like in the note, it said H2O equals zero. Is that just for height of HCO? And uh, OH minus equals OH plus the pH percentage? Yeah, so at equilibrium for the water dissociation, the H plus is equal to OH minus at pH 7. So the equilibrium constant there is 10 to the minus 14th <coughs> because the, the products times the uh, excuse me the uh, products of the reactants turns out to be just because water is one we assume water is one um, then the uh, h plus times the oh minus equals the equilibrium constant so when those two are equal it's basically taking 10 to the minus 14th and um, taking the square root of that gives us 10 to the minus seventh so those two are and by definition those two are equal w when those are equal they're they're equal to 10 to the minus 7. So, the, and the question on, for those of online was kind of asking about how we get the, uh, the equilibrium constant for water and how that relates here. Did I, did I answer your question? Yeah, so it's not the same. You wouldn't apply it to those. Right, we don't, we don't apply that here. The water stuff, that's happening, um, but we're not really concerned with that in this problem. Yeah, so for those online, the, another question about the total is, you know, the HOCL plus OCL minus, that's 100%. Yeah, so the total, like, we, we would say 100% of the chlorine is in either HOCL or OCL minus form. At the start, we had 100% of it in the HOCL form. And so 
after it dissociates, the total percentage is going to be whatever percent is in HOCl plus whatever percentage is in OCl minus. Okay. So whenever you plug it in, like, at the bottom right here, you just put, like, two and just put, you know, 100.1? Well, these, these are not, since I've got them in brackets, I'm meaning the total molar concentration. Oh, yeah. So the question was, when we have total here, what value is it 100%? What I'm going to use is this total I solved for right here. Uh, right over here, um, because that's the total molar concentration um, that we added with the uh, 15 milligrams per liter. So you'd kind of be looking at it like initial and final states, I guess you could say. Yeah, so the question is, we're looking at it kind of initial and final states. In a way, yes. So we, we have this initial state of we add 15 milligrams per liter in one state, then it dissociates and now that it's dissociated, we're looking at uh, how much is where. It, in terms of the timing, we kind of presume it's almost instant. So it, it, it's not like on a timeline per se, but it is, yeah, initial versus the, the final um, result. OK, so if anybody has the answer, feel free to fill me in. I'm going to work on it on Excel. Happy to answer more questions while I do so. In fact, I could just bring it over for you. Oops. Maybe. So um, question online, oh, thank you. So somebody filled in the, uh, one of the final, one of the answers here. But um, question here is what is the H plus concentration? We get that from the pH. That's going to be 10 to the minus 7. Uh, since the pH is 7, um, that's, that's what the, you know, the P means um, log, negative log of X equals the pH and where X is the H concentration. So H plus is going to be 10 to the minus 7. So this almost works. Yeah. So when, we, when we're looking at the pH, um, and the question was, can I explain that better? Um, when we're doing pH, this is going to be equal. So the, the way the P works, we're going to, I'll remind you here. So P is really saying, uh, let's say P of X, we have negative log of X equals P of X. So when we say um, if our pH is 7, so in this case pH 7 equals negative log of H plus. So that means you know, the, the way logarithms work, we could take 10 to the power of both sides here. It's a log base 10. So 10 to the power of both sides means um, we let's flip that negative over to the other side. So it's negative 7 equals log of h plus. So that means 10 to the negative 7 equals h plus. Okay, so it's a, just a little bit of a, a simplification thing there. So definitely keep that in mind. Um, Anytime you're dealing with pHs, you're going to need to be able to do that. Um, fortunately, it's it's kind of convenient because you just do 10 to the minus whatever the pH is. Um, okay, so let me try to wrap this up here. Um, oops. Just give me the... No, it's not what I want. So what I'm going to do then is I've got the pH solved right there. Go ahead and divide that by the equilibrium constant that I've got there. Multiply that by the total, which I solved there. All that divided by 
one plus, again, the H plus, let me just give it H plus divided by the Ka again. Alright, so that should give us 2.22 times 10 to the minus 4. So then we take that, divide it by the total. So that's in moles per liter. Uh, take that divided by this 2.86 times 10 to the minus 4 moles. That's going to give us the fraction that is HOCl in the system. So I'm going to take that and say this divided by the total and multiply it by 100 to get to percentage and there we have it. Um, what did I do wrong? Oh, Excel is kind of silly. I'm just going to leave that as a number then. and we'll call that percent. So that's 77.6 percent. And because that's parts not going to show, my face is in the way, what was it 77.6? Okay. Oops. Sorry having trouble finding my cursor. There we go. All right, that would be our final answer. Like I said, should be above 50%. Um, so I'm comfortable with the calculations uh, now that we've seen it. So that, that should be the final answer here. Um, we know that that's not too far from the that equilibrium, the 7.54, because if pH was 7.54, then this would be exactly 50%. Um, we wouldn't even need to do any math. We could just say that's 50% that's of each. Okay. Um, any other questions or issues here? All right. So we'll move on from that and start talking about filtration. Like I said earlier, we're not going to deal with equations for filtration today. This will primarily be um, getting you acquainted to what I mean by filtration and what we're doing with um, granular filtration. So granular filtration is the, what we're going to um, talk about first um, today, next time we have a lecture, and then we'll get into membrane filtration. So granular filtration, you can think of the typical typical way we do it is we have some uh, some amount of water in a filter bed. In that bed we have a layer of sand and maybe gravel kind of stuff that, that fills this bed. Water is going to seep through it and es essentially the um, as the water goes through we have filtration but it's not um, it's not exactly um, size exclusion type stuff. It's more like particles are settling within this filtration bed. So all the particle settling we were just talking about, if you imagine having tiny little pores through the sand grains, you have like a million little channels which are acting as sedimentation basins or adsorption sites. So the particles, instead of sedimenting in our big sedimentation chamber, as the water flows through, and is collected, um, we end up with lots of places for the particles to get caught or stick or to sediment. Um, so most of that's going to be what we would call adsorption or impaction. Um, an example here of some sort of granular filtration chamber would be a Brita filter. Now those also have a lot of adsorption of chemicals going on too. That's kind of why we use the that charcoal type of stuff, it's called activated carbon. It has a lot of adsorption sites, so if you have some chemical in your, in your water, 
it also grabs the chemicals just as a uh, chemicals adsorbed to the surface. They're not chemically reacted, but they, they're loosely bonded, kind of like the hydrogen bonding sort of stuff. Uh, so that's, that's one example of granular filtration. Um, you could even think of uh, using, you know, passing water through coffee ground, grounds in a way that's granular filtration, except we're trying to achieve the opposite. We're trying to take whatever's on the grounds out into the water. Um, so a similar process there. Membrane filtration is a bit different because it's operating on a size exclusion basis. So if we have some sort of particle and it's traveling through, it's going to get stuck on its way through because it's too large um, and then clean water comes out, right? So the particles go through, particles um, get in onto the membrane and are excluded by size and are, you know, sometimes we'll have a continuous flow where we have continuously draining the dirty water and so it'll just hit the hit the surface and kind of slide away with the the waste stream of the membrane filtration um, we'll, we'll get into more more specifics on that later um, an example you know is a screen porch keeping mosquitoes out they're physically excluding them by size right that's um, you know a, a tennis ball doesn't go through a tennis net just simple size exclusion um, doesn't really matter. Um, but membranes, we, we can get very small, so that's, that's the deal. Okay, so first we're going to talk about this granular filtration. That's what we're going to focus on. Um, sometimes it can do some mechanical screening, like we we're just talking about for the membranes, but that's not the majority of it. So if you have a large particle, too large to get stuck, you know, to go make it through the, the pores, yeah, it, it'll do some of that especially as the pores get clogged with more and more smaller particles. It'll start constricting the pores and then maybe we get more size exclusion. But we don't want to rely on that. Um, that that's not kind of the, the major um, focus of granular filtration. More often we're doing that sedimentation, you know, particles actually just sedimenting onto other, onto sand grains or whatever maybe some flocculation, the particles are given this opportunity, they're um, run through channels where they're gonna be likely to meet and start aggregating and then they don't fit through or they then they sediment. Um, maybe they're just passing along through the side and they get stuck on the edge somewhere. You can see a particle here. Um, that would be called interception. And once a couple of particles start catching, then they're more likely to catch other particles, especially if there's some destabilization added. Usually when we're doing granular filtration, this is after our sedimentation. Um, we'll, we'll usually do like the screening, an initial sedimentation, coagulation, flocculation, another sedimentation, and now we're on to granular filtration. So there is, there are probably some particles still in there, but they're also probably destabilized at this point. So a lot of the same mechanics of destabilization are going to help us out during this process. Um, hopefully they're destable with regards to the surface of uh, these grains as well. Okay, and then impaction just kind of means um, as it's going through, uh, normally it would meander with the flow, but the particle's too heavy, so it, it impacts the surface instead of, you know, before it can move out of the way with it. Um, so lots of different ways in which the granular filtration works on a technical level, but you're ultimately just getting out small particles with a relatively simple method. So just as a couple examples here, um, in my lab, I, I would show you if we were allowed to have more people in the lab. If you're really interested, you're, uh, we can make a, an appointment and come see it. But I was given this uh, set of three granular filtration units. Um, these ones have this special media called Green Sand Plus stuff and, and anthracite. It's like activated carbon kind of stuff. Um, so we're doing this filtration in a column. You can, each of these columns are pressurized. Um, most of what we're going to talk about is more in a, a bed style where we're just using the pressure of water above it. But you can pressurize them in columns like these. This unit, you know, a, a larger one, version of this would be something you could use for um, iron and arsenic removal. 
that's kind of what it's catered towards. But it does the same same type of deal with uh, if you had some particles, you catch those particles in the in these columns in the granular filtration as as water goes through. Um, if you're doing a column based in a larger setup, here's a a picture of some example I found online where you just have a bunch of these chambers, essentially large columns, where you pressurize the water, push it through the granular media, um, and get your filtration. Now, the, this pressurization and the, the column way of doing things, you have to be careful because if you, if you have your sand grains and they're not compact correctly, you can get channelization where water starts shoving through and making a bigger channel and just bypassing the filtration altogether by just making that channel. We call it channelization, and then it, water just goes streaming through without seeing the treatment that we expect. Uh, okay, so a couple more pictures here. This is maybe what it would look like in practice. Um, your sand grains, you probably have your media supported. So this media supported by larger gravel pieces, all of that on some grid, you know, you want to keep your media, but let the water through. Um, and there's a person inside a sedimentation basin, or a, excuse me, a filtration basin, filtration bed, and they're, I think they're lowering in a, a whole bunch of media here. So um, these, these things use quite a bit of media. So one of the, one of the things about operating these is you, you design them so that you can keep using the same media. You can clean it, regenerate it. Um, and the, you know, it's, it's tons and tons of sand and, and usually fairly specific with the, the size so you can control the filtration process. You, you have a good idea of what's going to happen in that process if you know your, your particle sizes. Um, and you want it consistent. You want to avoid the, the channelization and all that type of stuff. So a lot of what we're going to talk about with granular filtration is how to operate in a way where you're not you're not replacing this, but rather you're backwashing, you're routinely cleaning it so that you can um, have that continuous use. Another uh, picture of um, these filtration beds in practice. So each of these uh, s squares, or actually, looks like they're actually, they go this whole length, I think. Um, so each of these beds here are filtration beds. Um, Kind of hard to tell. They might be divided actually at each one of those. Uh, in either case, whatever size the beds are, um, they are actively running right now. They've got water loaded on top of them. The, the force of gravity is pushing water through and uh, filtration is presumably in operation right now in this, in this picture. Okay, so just a quick little bit of history and some info about our typical designs. Um, we, I mentioned, but we're pretty much always using sand or some equivalent granular stuff. Anthracite is pop, uh, popular. Granular activated carbon um, is another one. A lot of times they'll, they'll have a mixture of a couple of them, right? They'll have some half of it sand or maybe 40% sand and 60% anthracite, something like that just based on uh, their practice, what they what they find works best for their situation. The activated carbon, um, usually we're using that more for chemical type stuff. If we've got contaminated groundwater that's um, contaminated with petroleum products, we'll usually be pumping that up and out through a granular activation activated carbon filter. It will be granular filtration, but that's more of a chemical process rather than the, the particle removal. So we're going to keep um, most of what we talk to talk about here um, in regards to particle removal, although the same t same type of technology is is working with the activated carbon. Um, you just would have to regenerate that a little bit differently. Backwashing um, when it's chemicals adsorbed onto there, you can't just backwash. You probably have to uh, heat it or change the pH, some things like that, to strip off the chemicals that you. Um, you got on there and again it's it's all about using some process to remove stuff in the water that you don't want there right and then you can take it to the landfill if you can collect it all again or you can incinerate it whatever you need to do 
um, if you can more easily collect it into a smaller um, pile of, of pollutant or whatever. Okay, the first granular um, media uh, filtration um, attempts were actually what we would call slow sand filters back in the 1800s. So kind of a very rudimentary filtration. You probably could just get the idea from groundwater. Groundwater tends to be cleaner, so let's m mimic that. Let's let water slowly seep through some granular media. Um, so th that's been in practice for a long time. Uh, sometimes we still use it, but it pretty much only for biological treatment. So with that amount of time, there's going to be a lot of biological activity, especially if we have kind of a water that's got a lot of waste, pro waste stuff in it, a lot of nutrients. Um, there's going to be lots of bacteria on the grains of sand, um, and they will, they will grow and uh, consume a lot of that media. So that's kind of the, the current use of slow sand filters. Um, right now what we use are what we call rapid. I, I showed you examples of those. Basically all of our, our current ones we refer to are rapid sand filters. Okay, a few terms to understand the operation, and I'll, I'll draw some schematics for you about these in a minute. So filter ripening, um, that's the early stage of operation after, after being washed or after um, being installed new. Um, this is kind of a warm up step where, you know, some, I, I mentioned earlier, once you start having some particles accumulate onto the surface, then it, you end up getting, capturing more and more particles. So it's, some of the ripening is just that, allowing an initial few particles to get set. Um, some of it's also the sand itself um, shaking back down into place and um, becoming, uh, you know, any maybe air bubbles that got left in there or something like that, kind of flushing that out, getting it settled to a point where we've got consistent pores. Um, during this stage, water is not coming out very clean. It's actually kind of like you if you set up a new Brita filter and you start pouring water through it, you get the black specks. Um, kind of similar principle. Uh, there's there's stuff there that just needs to come out, um, and that that's this rinse stage or ripening stage. Okay, backwashing is pretty obvious. We flush water in reverse. Sometimes we add an air step, um, or possibly combine them both. So sometimes it'll be just water. Maybe it's an air purge for a few minutes and then some water. Um, either way, uh, you know, the, the point is to get all of those particles, all the nastiness that we just collected for the, you know, maybe 24 hours of operation and collect that in a wastewater stream. Um, so that'll require further processing later, maybe even a wastewater plant will we'll take it and handle it. Um, but essentially that backwashing um, is allowing the filters to... Um, to become clean enough to, to operate again. So head loss is another term. This is a term we use to describe the increasing amount of pressure required to operate as the filter gets dirtier. So as you imagine, you, you're filling up the, the sand and all the, um, the grains with, with particles, you're blocking pores, it's requiring more pressure to push water through. Uh, whether that's more water loaded on top to get the same flow rate coming out or it's higher pressure in the column system. Either way, we call the, the pressure as head and the head loss then is the, that pressure drop across the filter. Turbidity is the last term here. We talked about it before and I'm going to show a few more examples. It's basically a measure of the particles in the water, so the kind of the cloudiness of, of water. and we can measure that by looking at how far light can go through or how much light is scattered. There's a technical term, nephilometric turbidity units. Um, that N word is hard to, hard to say, pronounce. Um, don't really need to worry about it too much, but that's, there is a kind of a standard way. Um, just as a few examples here, um, you know, clear water versus high turbidity. You can kind of see uh, what that's going to look like. The, there's a disk method of observing how far you can see into water um, until you no longer have resolution between um, black and white portions of this disk. 
So that's, uh, that's one method. I see somebody doing it in practice. And you can gauge, you know, based on that depth at which you can no longer see, um, see what's happening with it, um, that you can measure your turbidity that way. Um, you can also do it with just a, a small device with a kind of like a colorimeter or something with light shining through how much light gets through, um, assuming you're not measuring absorption, um, just measuring scattering instead. Anyway, um, so those are the terms and what I wanted to, why I wanted to introduce those terms is because we can use them to know when we need to backwash. It turns out that this backwashing process, the, the filtration or the filter regeneration process is really the, the important part of designing a granular filter. Uh, the reason for that is because we need to know how much water we're going to lose by because we need to take clean water. We have to take clean water to backwash. So we've purified a bunch of water. We take some of that and waste it by backwashing. Um, so during, let's say, 48 hours of operation, a treatment plant needs to be able to manage and say, OK, well, we can produce x amount of water um, continuously that because that's the demand right we they have to supply their municipality x amount of water on a constant basis um, so when they have to take one filter down to clean it are they still producing that much water how are we going to calculate for that so uh, determining when we backwash is really important and then the next time we you know after the exam we'll come back and start talking about okay how much water are we producing on, on average, and how can we um, determine the, the number of filters required? At, you know, if we have to backwash this frequently, that means you know we have to have a certain amount on the whole time, um, or at any given time. Okay. Okay. So coming back to when we backwash, uh, kind of the most most important criteria, uh, most important methods we use. One would be the head loss. So as it gets harder to push water through, um, there is some risk of channel channelization if we let the pressure get too high. Um, so we want to make sure that the pressure doesn't get too high. That's uh, one scenario. Uh, a simple time limit would be another. So maybe the operators kind of know by experience that after a certain amount of hours, it's, it's generally time. Um, or a turbidity limit. So any of these ways are are pretty common, um, certainly valid ways to des decide on when to backwash. And a lot of times there'll be a combination of them. One, one thing that can affect um, your timing as well would be, you know, if you're in Louisiana and you've got a rainstorm randomly, you get a lot of more sediment in your water. So maybe you've got a lot more particles or different type of particles in your filter. Um, backs up more quickly or maybe you're in Arizona and your your water that you're coming in that you've got coming in just is always the same because it's just the same source and there's never any rainstorms you know something like that you can imagine different conditions different places are going to have different needs so uh, these are the the three ways we would do it um, so if we look at a timeline um, and look at how the turbidity limit would work let's Let's imagine our timeline as we just cleaned it. So right here is a clean, a clean filter. Um, and we're just starting to, to run our system. Well, the first few minutes, and I'm going to put this in a, maybe about 20 minute mark. I know I said this uh, time is going to be in hours, but we'll make a break here. So the first 20 minutes, this is kind of the rinsing stage. So rinsing or ripening, let's call it rinse. And if we look at what's happening with the turbidity, this first little bit, you know, well, first of all, let's let's make a limit, an artificial limit to how high we're going to allow the turbidity to go. So anything above here is going to be a cutoff time where we are no longer allowed to operate. We have to take it down and clean it. So typical operation might be, you know, a little bit below that or a fair amount below that. But during the ripening stage, right after we uh, we clean it, 
we're actually very likely going to break our limit there um, because like I said earlier there's more particles escaping during that rinse stage uh, because it's really just not ready yet then we're gonna come down once our, our rinse is finished let's say the the rinse mark is like that didn't draw that very well we can try again um, so if that's our rinse spot then from there our, our turbidity usually kind of goes off and then for the next X number of hours just start slowly increasing and then maybe crosses the uh, the limit right there and we say okay well that's our time then we're going to end production let's do this so here then we end our cycle or end production rather so everything between the rinse stage when that ends and at this point we're producing water then after that we stop and we have some sort of backwash So whatever whatever happens between there, some time, and then we start over. Um, so we'll say from here would be the next next cycle. Okay, so that's kind of a typical timeline, and that's what it would look like for the turbidity. Um, that rinse stage again is too dirty to use, so we don't use that water. And then as we get going for the next, I don't know, something like up to a hundred hours worth maybe um, you know anywhere between 24 and 100 hours something like that might be typical um, we have operation then we stop it for backwash okay so another another um, thing would be the head loss so if we look at our pressure as a function of our our time um, we actually usually measure this in meters, by the way. So how many meters of water are added on top of the uh, filtration bed, pushing the water through, um, giving us that, that hydraulic head. Um, so we might look at this as one meter added, two meters added, and maybe our limit is just under two meters. like that so then if we just take a look at what the pressure is doing um, turns out that this is usually a pretty linear thing and it's most likely just going to be increasing slowly until we hit that mark and we say okay that time to stop the uh, stop the filtration stop the production and after we stop of course we're gonna backwash then we're gonna rinse we know we do the whole thing again so we still have the rinse section here um, that's not really affecting the uh, the pressure much at all okay um, time limit is very straightforward not gonna bother with that um, but you, you get the picture for the time, time limit. The uh, head loss is quite straightforward. Again, a few reasons why we might want to do it. Um, last thing I want to make clear, and maybe I should have started with this, was um, what does a cycle look like? Um, so a full cycle is going to, just write it here, stop. OK, a full cycle here, we're going to have, at the start, we'll say the start is the rinsing step. You could potentially start at the production step and have the rinsing at the, the end, but this is how we're gonna to work it here. So this is gonna be the rinse or ripening. And this typically lasts anywhere from like 10 to 20 minutes. Then we've got production. Like I said, anywhere between 24 and 100 hours. 
then eventually we stop and sometimes we'll do an air air purge step and then backwash now the air purge doesn't always happen but it's important to note that during that step we're neither producing nor using water unlike the backwash where we're not producing but we're also wasting water at some rate going backwards um, which you know that will typically last like 20 minutes air purge maybe five minutes <laughs> So this is a typical scale. Um, I have a, a video I was going to show you. I don't quite have, well, we've got like five minutes. Um, so maybe I'll go ahead and show you anyway. Um, it's just sedimentation, so I don't know why it would be. Don't know why you need to hear more than five minutes of that, right? Um, OK, so I'll pretty much leave off here. For those watching online, I'm going to, if I can get my, um, find it again. I'm going to mute myself and let it play through the the screen instead. Where'd he go? Maybe. Well, I will try to, so you don't have to listen to it twice through the computer and through the um, through the audio here. Um, I'm going to also turn down the audio, so it's because it's maybe that's just what I'll do. All right. Anyway, so here's a a wastewater treatment plant, or excuse me, a drinking water treatment plant. This is a bed that's um, they stopped production and they probably let it settle for a little while, and then now they're backwashing. So you can see all that uh, nasty looking water coming back through. So they're pumping clean water back up through the system. This is going to go on for several minutes. I'm going to turn down the lights so you can get an even better image. OK, so this goes on for a little while. Um, not a lot to see right now. What they're doing is they're just air purging. So they're, they're sending bubbles through. Sorry, I misspoke earlier. Right now, this is just an air purge. So that's why we don't, we don't have water flowing upwards. Um, so this is the air purge goes on for a little bit, but with what water is there, you can see it's getting really, uh, quite dirty. From now they're uh, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, mute that for you. Um, they're purging the uh, the pipes, they're priming them, purging them of air so that they can start pumping water, which will begin in a moment. So in here you can see this uh, collection basin. Um, all of these little trough things that are hovering there, those those are used to collect water that they're backwashing. Um, and take that water into this trough uh, to to then go and take that to um, to a waste stream. So this is this is a pretty typical design where you've got some sort of trough system like this um, where it all feeds over. So I think they're at this point they're probably still on the air purge. Priming the pump. And then the fun begins. You'll see what that uh, that person was saying in in a moment here when uh, when it starts pouring over the uh, the edge. Okay, so it fast forward a little bit. Water's coming up. You can see it's pretty nasty looking. Overtops these things, and then you get what appears to be root beer. Okay. So quite a lot of uh, 
gross looking water, right? So that's, you know, that, that's pretty typical of, um, you know, one filtration cycle's worth of, uh, of particles. Um, looks pretty nasty, but, um, you know, it could just be, you know, you could think of it kind of like tea, you know, it, it's not all necessarily the worst, grossest of particles, but it's an accumulation of lots and lots of volume that has gone through these, these systems. And so then they'll probably flow, flow that backwards for another 15 minutes or so. Um, and let's see, I don't know if this one shows it when it gets cleaner. Um, just because it's interesting, I think I'm going to, I'm going to go to this next video that's usually plays right after. Um, and we're going to skip forward quite a bit through It's kind of the same process. This might not even be the same one, but it's kind of cool when you can see what happens when the water gets clearer um, as it's coming through. So they've been backwashing for a little bit. Um, this will work, yeah. So you can kind of see that the um, the water's becoming clearer as they're going through. Um, okay. Looks like at this point in this in this video, they're they've stopped the backwash, and I think they're starting to flow water to be treated back in into this trough system, and it's going to um, overflow. In, into the uh, into the beds. Okay, so that's that's about it. Um, there you can see it's a little clearer now. That's the water they're treating. Um, so unless you have any questions, that'll be it, and we'll see you on Tuesday uh, in class unless we've arranged otherwise. So have a good weekend. So is your H plus, is that the...